Jesus talked a lot about the devil. He came to earth to fight against the works of the devil. Now, uh, I don't think any of us want to go back to the superstitions of the late Middle Ages and, and witchcraft and worry about devils everywhere. Uh, C.S. Lewis says the devil is equally pleased with two errors about him, uh, obsessing about him and disbelieving in his existence. I don't think many of us are in danger of obsessing about him, but we are in danger of ignoring him. We're at war. What happened on 9-11 when you suddenly realized that the nation was at war? What happened in your consciousness? How, how did your mind change? You suddenly became utterly alert and aware, and the blinders were removed from your eyes, and you thought it, everything was at peace and harmony and contentment, and then suddenly, boom. Well, it's been 9-11 for 2,000 years. And as Paul says, our enemies are not flesh and blood. They're not even Islamic terrorists. Our enemies are much worse than that. They're, they're evil angels. And the, uh, the colonies that those evil angels plant in our own lives, namely sin, that's our enemy. Sorry to give you some bad news. Uh, <laughs> the good news is that uh, uh, Jesus said when he came, uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So he's defeated. He's, he's, he's still making a lot of trouble, but he's defeated. He's like, well, one of the punishments the ancient Romans had for prisoners uh, who were convicted of murder uh, they had grisly punishments. One of the punishments they had was to take the corpse of his victim, the rotting corpse of his victim, and chain it to his back and throw away the key. So for the rest of his life, he had to carry around a rotting corpse on his back. Well, in a sense, that's a gruesome image of us. The devil is dead, so to speak. Not, he can't die, he's a spirit, but uh, God, he's, he's been conquered. Yet he can do a lot of harm. He's like a Tasmanian devil. You know, those animals that go crazy, like a, like a dog frothing at the mouth. Uh, he can't get at your, your soul. He can't possess you if you're a Christian, but he can certainly tempt you. Now, not, most temptations don't come direct from the devil, but the war room in hell is the basic strategy place where temptations from the world and the flesh uh, are, are strategized. The devil is very pleased uh, when our society uh, becomes a more and more decadent society so that it becomes easier to be bad and harder to be good. The best definition of a good society I ever heard is from Dorothy Day, who was sort of the American Mother Teresa. She might be canonized soon. She said, a good society is simply a society that helps people to be good. Well, by that definition, we are not a very good society, certainly not as good as we used to be. Yes, question over here. Um, do you have any explanations as to why um, the devil has become elusive and people are just don't believe in it? Yeah, it's not fashionable. It's, it's not fashionable. You're laughed at if you believe in the devil. Yeah. You're scorned by the media. You're called a fundamentalist. And crazy. By the media standards, Jesus was a fundamentalist. Billy Graham was once accused of wanting to turn the clock back 200 years. And he said, that's not fair. I want to turn it back 2,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a choice. You can either say that my authority is the New York Times, or you can say my authority is the eternities. Uh, it's, it's either you know, the editors of the uh, popular journals, or it's Jesus. I don't think anybody thinks that after they die, they're going to be judged by the editorial board of the New York Times.
question of why he suffered and God essentially comes out and says, where were you when I was you know, created in the earth? Which is, for a modern man, a very unsympathetic response. Yep. How do we respond to who has a good I don't think we can do better than God did. The, what God didn't say to Job is as important as what he did say. He could have recited chapter 1. He could have explained to Job, you see, I had a reason for doing this. I used the devil uh, to test you to prove that you're a saint. See? He didn't say that. He just said, trust me. I'm the one who designed you, not you. Where were you? When, when, when you were designed in heaven, were you there? <laughs> you can hear the, uh, the Jewish humor there. <laughs> oh, you were there. <laughs> so it's an invitation to faith. It's a severe test of faith. And I think God wants that. Because if your faith isn't tested, it's not going to be strong. If faith is easy, it's going to be weak. If there are no reasons for not believing, then you don't have to expend any effort to believe. Faith is a virtue. God will take care of it in the end. As St. Teresa says, the, the, the most horrible life on earth, the one filled with the most unjustified suffering imaginable, will be seen by that very person when they get to heaven and turn around and look at their past life on earth will be seen to be no more important than one night in an inconvenient hotel. She suffered a lot. She was not minimizing suffering. So here, here is, let's say, your or my lump of suffering. It's not very much. We, have, we live comfortable lives. Let's say here is uh, St. Teresa or Mother Teresa who had a dark night of a soul or a life. That's, that's a mountain of suffering. Okay. Uh, how big must the joy of heaven be to counteract that? Infinite. That's the answer. We're not there yet, so we have to hope and believe. But if we were there, we wouldn't need faith. We'd see it. I actually kind of want to follow up on that. Um, God's answer is essentially trust. Yep. Prior question that brought up. Job's situation because an argument for atheism. In other words, many people don't believe in God because of this. God's answer to Job says, trust me. If we say no, God's answer to Job to these atheists, we are saying, assume God is there. It's a meaningless answer, as I see it. Unless you assume that God is there. Right. You've got to answer their question on its own grounds, rationally. If you, if the question in the first place is if God is there. You're right. You, you've got to at least make them see that it's possible for an intelligent person to believe that God is there, and therefore there's a ground for trust. So I'd, I'd say something like this. Uh, let's look at atheism and theism as two hypotheses, two scientific hypotheses, both of which claim to explain the data. Now, if there were a God, whose mind is infinitely wiser than ours, would you expect to understand the meaning of suffering? Of course not. If you did, that would count against the theistic hypothesis. That would mean God is no smarter than you are, or you're as smart as God is. So that does not refute the hypothesis. On the other hand, your hypothesis that there is no God, how does that justify you in being angry at God for injustice? <laughs> 